We finally reached spring in Washington, D.C., and we're very pleased to have today with us a distinguished guest. Uh, I'm Nancy Birdsall, if any of you are. I, I see a lot of old friends, a uh, very distinguished audience, and some newcomers, too. So I'm Nancy Birdsall, president of the Center for Global Development, and I'm really honored and privileged finally to have the opportunity <laughs> to welcome uh, Secretary General Angel Gurria of the OECD to talk to us about his challenges. Since the OECD is 50 years old this year, um, it now has 34 members, and it has, I don't think the OECD likes to be called sort of the thinking organization, but that's what I like to that's the way I think of the OECD, as the thinking organization uh, used to be of the rich world, and now it's of more than the rich world. And it is serving as a key multilateral player in an increasingly complicated system. Uh, it's always done that, in a sense, for its own members, and increasingly under Secretary General Gurria, it's doing that on the larger set of complex global problems. I think in part inspired and reinforced in that direction uh, by the creation of the G20 and the reality that we no longer live in a world in which the rich nations can be an effective club to deal with cl uh, global challenges. We need a larger club. And my understanding is that um, Secretary General Gurria whom I, now, I will now go back to calling Angel, um, has played a, an important role in that. Um, no one has been indeed better placed to lead that kind of effort and to answer the kinds of questions that matter today in the multipolar world than um, Angel. As many of you know, he is the first OECD head to come from a major developing country. He's a former finance minister and foreign minister of Mexico. I knew him in the days as a finance minister when I can remember him saying to me at a luncheon something like, this is unbelievable actually, for every decline in the price of oil, which was then about $18 a barrel, uh, that's a, an increase in Mexico's deficit of 1%. Some, he had some formula like that that a good finance minister would have up his sleeve. Um, he's very well positioned to guide the organization's transition in this new environment. I'm also pleased and proud that Angel is one of the board members of the Center for Global Development. He has now served three consecutive three-year terms and is marking with us by his presence here our 10th anniversary. They're 50, we're 10. Uh, he's cycling off the board with other uh, founding board members, and so we're jumping the gun a little and uh, asking him to accept today his uh, awards while we thank him with this small token of our appreciation. Angel, let me help you. <laughs> There. No, there's more than that. Oh. There's more than that. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Well, the T-shirt is there. The but let's get a there. picture. There. Let's get a picture. There you One of him. <laughs> and let's see. There's and then, something a little more weighty in here. Uh, I'll open it for you, and and well, we'll show it off later. The color is from Tiffany. Isn't it? The color is. <laughs> these are our signature colors at the Center for Global Development. I now turn it over to you. There you are, Jerry. All right, we'll oh. open it now. There. Or the globalist of the year, which I... <laughs> there you are. Whoop. you got to get it out. This is another piece of <laughs> this, is, uh, this is really bad news, all this stuff. We're not yeah. supposed to have all this stuff. Well, you There's get a the price. Idea. There's a price. There's you a get price. the idea. You get there the it idea. is. There. There. The world. The world. No, quite, quite, quite. Don't say this. Thank you, Chelsea. So very good. The floor is yours. Very good. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nancy, ladies and gentlemen. 
Dean. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be here uh, at the Center for Global Development, together with uh, my dear friend and colleague uh, Nancy Burtzel, also my, my accomplice, because we've uh, done a lot of mischief together over the years. Uh, being a member of the board of the CGD is a badge of honor that I have worn with great pride. Nancy is not only a friend, uh, but also she's one of my heroes. And uh, she's a regular at the OECD. Uh, she visited only last year. She gave a fascinating presentation on the cash on delivery uh, aid approach developed by the center. Allow me to focus on uh, a critical issue of our organization that was uh, I was asked to address, which is its role in the new international architecture and, and the architecture itself, uh, which is evolving all the time. This is also a good opportunity to discuss some of our perspectives on the new architecture itself uh, and on, on global governance, um, which um, is a subject of uh, some concern. Shifting wealth in the world economy. Um, global development perspectives have been changing rapidly in recent years. The center of economic gravity is moving uh, from the advanced uh, to the large emerging economies, uh, China, India, uh, uh, Brazil. We call this shifting wealth. We just published a book called Shifting Wealth. It's actually pretty good reading. Uh, it's uh, uh, less uh, heavy than your usual OECD uh, publications. Um, and um, it was written in uh, memory of uh, Angus Madison, who unfortunately died before we uh, could put it out. Uh, it, um, it documents what's going on. Um, this shifting wealth means that substantial improvements in uh, growth, poverty reduction, and inequality are happening in the developing world, which is it's not just a question of how much of the world's GDP is on what side, but basically that there are substantive changes taking place in the society of these countries. The pace of change in recent years has been so rapid that the world economy today is barely recognizable. 50 years ago, when the OECD was founded, it accounted for 80% of the world's GDP. Today, the share is about 50 something, you know, below 60. Uh, well, we believe that in 20 years' time, 25 years' time, it'll be below 50, you know, it'll be 40-something. Uh, and uh, the emerging and developing will have the majority um, of the world's economy. So uh, this is, you know, and, and, and we're not talking about 100 years from now, we're talking only about 20 years from now. You know, we're, we're talking about 20, 2025, 20, 2030, we're talking tomorrow. Developing economies are faced with new opportunities in this new economic geography. We used to think that uh, countries progressed by building up their technological capacity in the manufacture of relatively simple commodities. You typically started with toys and textiles, etc. Build up from there slowly, upgrading uh, to more sophisticated goods. And today, of course, we know that that is not necessarily the only way to go. We know that development uh, has different paths and that technology allows for different paths to be used and that it is possible. The enormous untapped potential in South-South flows, for example, on, on trade, aid, investment, which countries can use for development, is also a new feature of the world economy. For example, in 2009, China became the leading trade partner of Brazil, India, and South Africa. Tata, the Indian firm, is the second most active investor in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, these tidbits, that they're, they're all in the book, by the way. Uh, and Jill Schuker here, the uh, head of our Washington office, will be happy to uh, provide you uh, with, uh, with a copy. Emerging economies now, this is interesting, now provide 100 times more aid to developing countries than they did in 1990 only. And they have now reached about 15% of what the uh, traditional OECD DAC donors provide. Effectively, we've discussed this with, 
Uh, China, no doubt. Uh, Brazil, no doubt. Uh, but perhaps even, you know, India, you take all the flows and all the things that they do for the, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, neighbors. And, and, and if, you, if you quantify things that are not necessarily in cash, but all the support and all the technical assistance and everything, um, and South Africa, um, Indonesia, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're pretty close to, to sort of being. But there, there are certainly no more. Those five no longer identify themselves as recipients of aid. Basically, in many cases, they are givers of aid. They're donors. So again, they are not only aligning their interests as investors, as exporters, as generators of intellectual property rights, in which their, their interests are aligned with the OECD countries because they, they want to keep all those things and respect all those things. And now their concerns are the same as the OECD in that sense. But also, in terms of their South-South relationships, they are probably now all net donors, which is, again, you know, an interesting part of the shifting wealth uh, phenomenon. Uh, one of the positive uh, consequences of rapid growth in a place like China or India uh, is poverty reduction. Since 1990, the number of people in the world living in extreme poverty on less than a dollar a day has fallen by about uh, a quarter, which is 500 million. Uh, the problem, of course, 90% of those are, uh, that have gotten out of that kind of poverty are in China. That's, that's a problem with the concentration. Uh, so the challenge is to better spread the benefit of uh, this shifting wealth. It, it seems mostly to be focusing on, on China. I just arrived from China the day, day before yesterday, actually, from spending uh, three or four days there and being at the China Development Forum. And of course, as usual, you know, you can barely recognize the place even if you were only there last year. The record of poverty reduction in the rest of the developing world is a little bit more mixed. And the Millennium Development Goals of halving poverty by 2015 is still some way off. There, the performance of some of our more important member countries uh, is not exemplary. Um, there are countries, I have to say, the United States has uh, stayed the course, uh, but some of the larger donors not. What the some of the other donors that are saying about the U.S. is that the United States commitment was not as ambitious as theirs in terms of debt to GDP. It's the single largest in terms of dollars, but, but in any case, the U.S. is delivering, whereas the others are not delivering. You know, whatever you know, they committed to, they're not delivering. And now with the constraints uh, going on with the budgets, what they're, so they're all saying charity starts at home and all these kinds of excuses. Uh, some countries are, 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 you know, in the face of one of the toughest uh, budgetary cuts, uh, the British, for example, they kept their, their aid intact. Uh, which is, is quite, you know, uh, newsworthy. Um, but some countries are not. Some of the uh, other large donors are just cutting down. And, uh, and uh, they, they've, um, they've included uh, aid in there, which is very, very uh, unfortunate. There's also a problem. Inequality is increasing in many of the high-growth developing economies. I have to say that before the crisis, we had documented that in 24 of the 30 OECD countries, that's the rich countries or the better off countries, whatever, uh, inequality was growing. Now, with the crisis, of course, it's a perfect storm in terms of inequality. Uh, but the problem is, of course, the inequality in the developing countries, uh, which is being exacerbated. Growth alone, clearly not enough. For emerging economies, the good news is that Thanks to their newfound wealth and prosperity, governments can afford to boost public spending on social protection, including welfare assistance, to reduce inequality. For developing countries, we have to go more than the proverbial extra mile. And here, the G20 and other sources of cooperation between advanced, emerging, and developing countries can, uh, can help. Now, these uh, new economic realities to what extent are they reflected in the way we're organizing the governance uh, of the world? Uh, to what extent are we uh, uh, basically, well, uh, doing uh, what, we, what we preach? Uh, what do these new economic realities mean for the global governance architecture? 
for international cooperation, for what I would call uh, 21st century multilateralism. Well, the shift in the center of economic gravity that we discussed above has to be reflected in the global governance architecture. Thus, the new players have to be given a stronger voice in decision making, and multilateralism has to evolve further in a more inclusive manner. The financial crisis has reinforced the need for intensified international cooperation between advanced, emerging, and developing countries. The strong, effective, and coordinated crisis uh, with which the G20 leaders responded uh, to the financial meltdown of uh, 2008 was somewhat, you know, unprecedented. The transformation of the G20 into the premier forum for international economic cooperation endorsed at the Pittsburgh summit is a welcome consequence of this trend. Sitting at the G20 table as equals, none as guests, in the G20, the eight, in the G8, they, or G7, uh, they used to, then they invited Russia, it's a, they used to come and then they, they'd invite the, the five for tea you know, and scones, as they would say in Britain. Um, but they wouldn't ask them to join in the definition of the agenda or on the communique or in the follow-up. And of course, in Heiligendamm, I remember, and it was in 2007, was it, uh, Gabriela? Is it Heiligendamm was a... Uh, or the seven or something like that. They were almost, we were pretty close to a, a breakup. They almost left the place, you know, the the, the, the G5, because uh, there was some part of the communique talking about climate change, which basically took for granted that because the G8 had agreed on it, the other guys would sign off, and of course it committed them. Uh, and uh, the G8 uh, miscalculated the uh, kind of impact that this would have in people like uh, Lula or like Singh or uh, Hu Jintao, or et cetera. And, um, uh, well, effectively, <laughs> they, they changed that particular paragraph. But, uh, so it's it's a, uh, you know, the, it was a big change when, when in Pittsburgh they said, it's 20, no longer, and actually it's not 20, it's a bit more. Um, the leaders of the countries at the heart of the shifting wealth story are now getting together to define common solutions to common challenges. This nascent rebalancing of voice and power is reflected, among other examples, in the decision to reform the international monetary institutions and the financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the voting powers, uh, the selection of the new uh, uh, heads uh, going forward. Uh, one of them uh, uh, actually, uh, depending on what uh, Mr. Tosca decides to do with the uh, his own uh, uh, vision of the future in uh, France, etc. The next year, there's a change to the World Bank, and it's scheduled to be in. It's a, but already these decisions have been taken. They're no longer. They're no longer. In the, it, there will be whoever in the next change. There will be a non-European or a non-American, or if they are Europeans or Americans, they will be so because they are the best, not because of their nationality. They will be competing out with others from all over the world, and it will not have to be this is it can be maybe a, another american it can be another european but they will be it's because they are the best candidates not necessarily because they were they were uh, 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 nominated by uh, by their respective uh, geographic uh, uh, countries of, of origin um, and that is a very important change itself i know we talked about it for years and years and years with nancy we uh we wrote uh, some with Paul Volcker, you remember, uh, uh, a report about uh, the, uh, the the governance of the World Bank and the governance of the IMF, and uh, and uh, these were some of the issues that we always mentioned. And now they are on the books. I mean, it's it's it, it, without the G20, this uh, probably never would have happened. But the G20 is not only about rebalancing decision making; it it deals with a large spectrum of issues, and above all, it provides a framework for enhanced policy coordination. And this is where the OECD comes in. We engage and support the G20 uh, on a number of areas, and let me just mention a few. On the adoption of, of structural policies within what they call the framework for 
strong, sustainable, and balanced growth, on policies for employment, skills, and jobs. The crisis today is about jobs, jobs, jobs. Le chômage, you know, it's 10% unemployment, but also 20% unemployment for the youth. On average, 25% here, more than 30% in France, 40 to 50% in Spain for the youth. This crisis started as a financial meltdown of the mortgages and stuff like, you know, the subprime, and it turned into an economic paralysis, and that transformed into a tremendous human tragedy whose more visible face is unemployment. And within that, the tragedy within the tragedy is that the uh, uh, 15 to 24 year olds who were told to stay one year, two years, three years more in school, and that the market would reward them for this special and additional effort and time and investment uh, are having their diplomas to cover themselves from the rain. You know, that's uh, not not a lot they're they're doing. Although I have to say the unemployment mostly is on on male, young but low skilled. I would say. That is important. That means we have a lot of skilled people with a, their diplomas that can't get jobs because, you know, just in the OECD, there are 17 million more unemployed than there were three years ago. Not only do we not have the jobs that should have been created, there are 17 more people without jobs. So it's, a ma it's massive. The total more means 50 in total. So it is very, very uh, uh, dramatic and very important. And of course, that includes many of the youth, as I said, that we encourage to go and be better prepared. We also work on liberalization of trade, investment, and capital flows. These are three things uh, very, said very fast. Trade, because think of what's going on in the world. Low growth, lower potential output, High unemployment, high deficits, huge accumulated debt. Perfect scenario for protectionism. Perfect for populism. Perfect for demagoguery. And, you know, this whole question of outsourcing and this whole question of, you know, uh, the production chains and, uh, and, and, and that is what is happening in some places, by the way. And, and it's it's terrible on incumbents. Just let me give you a little you know, a little story. We got, we got these 34 members now. And uh, the Czech Republic had two years with an interim government. The uh, Hungary had one year with an interim government. And the Netherlands had one year with an interim government. Belgium still has an interim government. They've been at it for almost a year now. Japan has had five governments in rapid succession. Um, Australia had one, two, three, you know, very fast. And uh, the UK changed government. Um, and of course, the governments that are still there, i.e. Italy, US, France, Spain. I was going to add Portugal, no more. Canada, we don't know, because we read the news that there may be a, a uh, discussion in Parliament about their budget. So you see socialist governments, right-wing governments, center-wing governments, coalitions, strong coalitions, weak coalitions, you know, governments with huge majorities, governments with, with minorities. Everybody is suffering. This kind of crisis was so generalized, was so important, was so deep was so brutal, was so fast. We lost so many jobs, so much wealth, so many exports that, you know, there's no single government that has weathered the storm. There are a few, a few that are doing better. They went through their bad patch, but, uh, you know, countries like Mexico, countries like Turkey, countries like uh, perhaps some of the Nordics, um, Austria, but, uh, and of course, Germany. But you count them with one hand. 
mostly there are big problems uh, in all of these investment because uh, now this question of uh, allowing the poor countries meaning the United States and Germany and Italy and France and all things are not allowing the other guys to invest the ones that have the reserves and capital flows because as Mr. Mantega the finest minister of Brazil recently said they call it the forex wars you know the foreign exchange wars so the question of uh, moving the um, the exchange rates in order to get the advantages in exports that they can't get through increased productivity or at least faster the promotion adoption of standards for anti-bribery for example the abolishment of fossil fuel subsidies actually we discovered that um, we subsidize we always we always criticize the uh, Europeans and the Americans for um, subsidizing agriculture and we said that you know there was a, a billion a day for the subsidies of agriculture that, well we subsidize fossil fuels more than we subsidize agriculture which is and it's this are the poorest countries in the world subsidizing the consumption of fossil fuels by the richest in their own societies which is a total contradiction you know uh, and a very sad state of affairs uh, we're working to see if we can improve that uh, on policies for efficient fair and transparent taxation systems uh, eliminating tax havens and uh, food security and commodity markets substantive problems of the underlying imbalances plus the problem of the derivatives and speculation and the sole consensus for development in its multi-year action plan here uh, um, is uh, with us uh, today Gabriela Ramos who is the chief of staff of the OECD but also the G20 Sherpa and she is uh, coordinating all our efforts at the G at the uh, OECD precisely to deliver these these goods and these uh, this support to the G20 so to deliver on its ambitious policy agenda the G20 must be equipped with a mechanism for candid and systematic policy sharing and a mechanism for monitoring commitments this is an important prerequisite for success in crafting consensus in a large heterogeneous arena the risk is to reach such consensus by converging towards the lowest common denominator instead of adopting ambitious high quality standards we're collaborating closely with the french presidency of the g20 um, this this year they are in november is the meeting of g20 in Cannes, and next year will be mexico uh, that will be doing the g20 uh, to support the design and implementation of some me of, of such mechanisms now what do we do uh, what's our role in this global governance uh, besides this this technical support on these substantive issues the OECD is supporting the emergence of the new architecture of global governance in many ways beyond its contribution to the G20 since, since 1961 the OECD has performed its role as policy advisor and pathfinder for members and partner countries. Evidence-based policy advice, our job strategy, some of you remember the job strategy, this, this became a, a bit of a, a classic. Um, and uh, I remember when I, when I called uh, um, Alan Greenspan to say, Alan, uh, I'm running for uh, Secretary General of the OECD. Uh, he said, uh, oh my God, yeah. You know, I remember as it was this this very important uh, contribution, which is uh, um, the job strategy. You know, and uh, I said, "Don't you remember anything more f recent?" You know, I said, uh, "Well, you know, I said, but the job strategy." I said, "Well, the uh, the unions remember our job strategy of '96 uh, as as something which helped them. Uh, it was a bad time. It was." It, a very bad time in terms of unemployment, et cetera. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, now sometimes we have discussions with the unions because they believe that uh, our insistence on the flexible labor markets uh, <laughs> is not necessarily in their, in their best interest. But of course, uh, we've proven again and again and again, countries are moving in that direction so that uh, uh, the uh, the employment protection legislation does not conspire against the creation of jobs uh, in these in these countries the PISA education test now covers about 70 countries <clears throat> PISA uh, 
where, uh, well, we just had this shock because uh, we now have 70 countries and China participated for the first time. Guess who got clean out first place on reading, on arithmetic, and on science, and, uh, well, Shanghai. By a big margin, the U.S. came out in the median, 500 points, Shanghai 600 points, some others in between, and then, of course, some other behind or below. The difference between 500 and 600 is 100. <laughs> Shrewd observation. The question is, each 40 points represent one year's difference in education. It is as if the American 15-year-old kids had gone to school or would have to go to school for two more years to catch up with the competencies of the 15-year-olds in Shanghai today. But also number three and number four were Hong Kong, and number five was, uh, you know, Macau, and uh, it just, they were all over the place in, the, you know, in between the, uh, the, the higher performances. And this is not about learning by heart the multiplication table. This is acquiring knowledge and acquiring information and then using it to better face life, to better face real life situations and address them and solve them and succeed. And it has a predictor capacity, which is much better than the report cards of those students. We got 25,000 Canadians that uh, kept on tracking 10 years more from their 15 year olds. And, and they, the, the, the scores of PISA have proven to be more accurate to predict their success in university and even in the first years of professional life than the report cards in those years. Very, very interesting. Arnie Duncan, the Secretary of Education of the United States, when he saw those results, asked me to come and roll the whole world PISA results out here in Washington. And uh, he invited me to a big town hall meeting there, televised and everything in the, new, in the museum here. And uh, a big to do, you know. We, we thought we were going to go you know, together, you know, some journalists, and we were going to. No, this was, you know, television, and a, a lot of schools around the country by internet, and they were sending questions, and uh, you know, this, this is a typical. It looked like the State of the Union kind of thing. Huh? And uh, and he said, "This is a massive wake-up call," and the president called it a Sputnik moment. So you know, it's this is a kind of contribution. That also, by the way, generated a meeting that we had only last week between, with Arnie Duncan and myself, we complicated it, and the and Education International, which is the cupola of the uh, trade unions for teachers' education. 25 of the more successful countries in the PISA study with their, finance, with their education ministers and their leaders of the teachers' unions. Fascinating dialogue just as Wisconsin was going on. Very interesting. Um, I can tell you about that another time. Um, so uh, we do, for example, uh, uh, our economic country studies. We do about 25 per year, full economic country studies. And by the way, that includes the BRICS, every one of them. Uh, the Eurozone also, uh, as a Eurozone and as Europe, not as country by country. We do country by country also. All those have helped policymakers and stakeholders pursue their reform agendas. Our pioneer work on the economics of climate change, the use of economic instruments to achieve environmental goals, uh, and with our work on innovation, we just rolled out our innovation strategy last year, and now we're rolling out next May in our 50th anniversary celebration, um, we're going to roll out our green growth strategy, and trying to get green and grow together, you know, and, and, and make them work together. Now, over the past five decades, the OECD has earned its credentials as a global standard setter also. That's another role we play. Our guidelines for multinational enterprises, our global forum on transparency and information exchange for tax purposes, meaning we have done away with bank secrecy, with the tax havens, We've made more progress in the last 18 months than did the 12 years before that. And I have to say, we also owe a very great part of this success to the G20 because they said, no more with a crisis. We will not afford 
either politically or morally or ethically or it's economically to lose a single dime in terms of taxes because X country Y and Z is allowing for deposits which will not be declared or disclosed to the country of origin. And we have now had 600 agreements signed and more as we speak among countries in the world to have full disclosure on request of tax information, which was not, and this, this is, includes all the islands in the Caribbean and all the European countries and, you know, a big, big change. And I have to say we, today, actually today, um, the Swiss Parliament approved an interpretation of language uh, of the different uh, agreements that they have with a number of countries uh, so that uh, it will be consistent with Article 26 of the OECD's uh, code. That means we'll provide the information on request. Uh, only today, because there was some pushback in Switzerland and we've now got it back on track. So this is very, very important. It was a big change. It was a big change in the world uh, about, uh, about that. Uh, our anti-bribery convention, uh, which uh, uh, is, ma is, by the way, it's binding. It's a legally binding convention. 38 members are 34 plus Argentina, Brazil, um, South Africa, and I think Romania, whatever, and, and some others are considering. Right now, as we speak, China, India, and Russia are proposing anti-bribery conventions to their respective parliaments. In Russia, the Duma already passed the first reading. We're waiting for the second, and therefore we may have a signing of Russia joining the anti-bribery convention um, to uh, in, in the ministerial meeting uh, at the end of May. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, well, we, we also do multinational enterprises, corporate governance, uh, you know, this is our strategy to serve as an important pillar in the new architecture of global governance includes three dimensions, openness, impact, meaning relevance, you know, it's not a question, we, we, we produce two or three books every day, but it's not about producing a thousand books every year. No, we're not an editorial. We're, we, it's about substance, but it's about policy proposals and to make them stick, to make countries actually practice. Um, and inclusion, inclusion. Last year, Chile, Estonia, Israel, and Slovenia became members of the OECD. We were 30 until last year. Now we're 34. Accession talks with Russia are advancing. They got to deal with their WTO, but they're advancing a lot with the WTO, so Russia may soon be finally knocking on our door. Well, they have been knocking on our door officially, but now the question is uh, uh, to uh, deal formally now with the, what I would call the last, the last stretch or the last mile of Russia's accession. And we're designing innovative arrangements to engage with our partners and uh, uh, with our member and partner countries in developing better policies in finding common responses to global challenges. As I said before, we are reinforcing our relations with key emerging economies, particularly Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, the enhanced engagement partners. I was in uh, India about three weeks ago. I was in China last week. I'll be in Russia next April. I'll be in Brazil, I think, next June. I was in Indonesia in October to deliver the full economic uh, report of Indonesia, plus an analysis of their investment policy reviews. And they asked us to do a regulatory policy review and their agriculture policy review. And now we're looking at an anti-corruption analysis. We just delivered an integrity analysis for Brazil, for example, uh, on the transparency, integrity of the, the governance and their systems and how to promote that. And also supporting there with uh, the competition um, uh, policies. So very active with these countries already, whether they're members or not. Plus, the active with Southeast Asia. We now have a Southeast Asia economic outlook, which we publish regularly. We now have a Latin American economic outlook, which we publish regularly, together with our African economic outlook, which we now publish yearly for 10 years, uh, something which is not normally associated with the OECD. You know, the OECD is, as uh, Nancy suggested at the beginning, more associated with uh, better developed or more developed countries. And, and uh, we are very, very active in, uh, in a, with the MENA, Min Middle East and North Africa. We're working very, very uh, hard on um, the governance of the economic issues in those countries. And of course, I, I think they're gonna be needing this kind of support more than ever after the turbulence uh, that they're going through. 
We need to show there is a clear value added, a multilateral cooperation. This is a very important challenge. Uh, and of course, the, counter, the counterfactual is unilateral action. And we need to prove that one beats the other every time. Here, the OECD can offer know-how, tools, recommendations, and our stamp of credibility and authority on these matters. It's all evidence-based. Nancy, friends, ladies and gentlemen, this year the OECD is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Our chairperson will be Hillary Clinton. We'll have Angela Merkel. We'll have Sarkozy. We'll have Prime Minister Khan. We'll have President Lee of Korea. We're going to have uh, Prime Minister Radicova of uh, Slovakia, President Turk of Slovenia, and uh, Prime Minister Orban uh, of Hungary, in both his capacity as Prime Minister of his country, but also as uh, Chair of uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be a plus, you know, dozens of ministers and uh, uh, very high quality representatives for our, uh, the forum, which is uh, before the, uh, the ministerial. In our first five decades, we've proven that international cooperation between countries with different visions induces policy convergence, or at least reduces the level of friction, and thus allows for more ambitious accomplishments to raise the quality of life among the peoples of the world. Building a new architecture of global governance takes time. It is a journey, not a destination. And we're here to help leaders navigate this journey and adopt what is the motto of our 50th anniversary and forward, better policies for better lives. Thank you. This is a text. Let me start with China. Uh, you mentioned just before you spoke that you'd been in China and you'd been visiting with US officials on China. And let me relate the question about China to everything you said about the value added of the OECD. You're sitting in a place that's a think tank, a think and do tank. So we get it. Uh, you have an asset, which is independence. You're not trying to push money out the door like the IMF or the World Bank, right? You're not uh, subject to the pressures, even at the G20, of domestic politics no. necessarily. So that's where the value added is. And it is very impressive to hear. I like hearing everybody does, in this kind of setting, evidence-based. And the breadth and depth of what you're doing is impressive. And it's always fun to hear from Angel because what's amazing is how much he knows about the two, two books a day that are being published. Now, it, you know, it, I don't know that much about the history of how this evolved at the OECD, but I think most people have an intuition that it started mostly with the Europeans and the US and Canada. It grew, you know. So it somehow reflects a set of values mm -hmm. that come from the consolidated, mature democracies. With the entry of China, for example, and other countries, you mentioned Russia, how will this work uh, in terms of retaining a measure of independence? I mean, no one would be, it would be naive to think you're completely independent all these multilateral organizations have uh, are subject in some sense at their clubs with members. Mm -hmm. But I think what I'm trying to say is how will it work if, if you become a club of the world? Will you look more like the UN than might be <laughs> ideal for an evidence-based organization. We, we aim to be global, not universal. That means if we would, for example, have uh, 40 odd members, uh, you know, today we are 34, uh, Russia 
is in the process of accession officially. It's, 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 uh, and let's say that the five countries that we call enhanced engagement, the mandate, by the way, of the enhanced engagement comes from the council, from the ministerial council, 2007. It's not that we picked them out of the blue and that it was, a, you know, because I feel good about these five countries. And it's, it's, a, there were, it's a mandate that I have, and it says enhance engagement with a view to possible membership. This second part is something that people often neglect to repeat, with a view to possible membership. So, so the, the club has to let you in. Well, uh, I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in China, or I'm in, uh, I'm in India, and they say, well, you know, what does uh, India uh, need uh, to join the OECD? Well, just uh, all they got to do is tell me, and then well, we've got to work at it. You know, uh, Mexico took three years to join the OECD. Uh, Korea took three years. Uh, Israel took three years. Chile took three years. So you know, it takes two to three years to do the aki and uh, all the compliance and. Uh, to adapt the rules, codes, regulations, whatever, or at least to make them uh, 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 consistent, or at least not 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 you know uh, contrary to uh, to the principles. But uh, what I mean is that it really is up to them. And I'm going to tell you something uh, with complete and total candor: uh, Russia, Chile, Israel, Slovenia, Estonia, uh, Mexico, Korea. We asked to join. We wanted to join. We thought we had a big stake in joining. We had. We wanted to send a message. And we also wanted to cement our reforms and improve the quality of the governance, the economic governance, by being in the OECD. But we also wanted to be a member of where the rules are being made or where the standards are being set, rather than being told of what the standards are and the expectation that we are supposed to abide by them, you know, which is what comes with membership. You get the right to be one of the ones who are there it's discussing. The table, right? Yeah. Now, with Brazil, China, India, South Africa, Indonesia, we sent them a message that we'd like them to work closer with us and that without their close cooperation and participation, we would not be a very successful global player. And it's not just because they're members or not, but because if they don't participate in the substance of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of proposing the policies or being part of the policies, things don't get done. How can you do trade? How can you do poverty reduction? How can you do uh, climate change? How can you do Doha, for heaven's sake, which is a low-hanging fruit, without China, India, Brazil, etc.? So this is important. Now, about our independence and our origin, we were born out of the Marshall Plan. When General Marshall pronounced his famous Harvard speech, which was one of the most generous and more visionary actions that the U.S. has ever made. Let's go and help Europe build itself up. But Europe, of course, had everything it takes. They needed the bricks. They needed the money, the mortar. They needed some, some financing. They had the knowledge. They had the education. They had the expertise. They had the entrepreneurship. So in a decade, they were back. And after a decade, when the money from the Marshall Plan had been spent, about 13 billion those years, about 100 billion these years, uh, you know, not, not a lot of money given that now we count trillions uh, in everything that we do. Uh, Europe was back on its feet, and the United States had acquired the most important, the most relevant, the most strategic ally they ever could have done. Well, at that time, then uh, Macmillan and, uh, and, and Eisenhower and uh, Adenauer and de Gaulle said, now we've got to go for the next step, which is convergence of policies with the rest of the world, not just Europe for the reconstruction. And uh, they created the OECD. And uh, 
and it's been like that ever since. I think there were close to 20 founding members and now the 34. Well, we don't need to be many more. But because of the shifting wealth numbers that I told you, without China, without India, without Brazil, without Indonesia, without South Africa, and particularly I would say without China and India, we're going to be, you know, losing numbers, but the numbers is not the, the great, the greatest importance. The question is, do we keep close tabs on what is going on there, and do we keep, keep close cooperation since the policy? Well, more and more, yes, we do. We've delivered, I don't know, 20 very substantive reports to the Chinese, and we continue to do that. And uh, we maybe 10 or 12 with uh, Brazil or uh, 15 with Indonesia or South Africa, whatever, all over the place. And they are members of an increasing number of committees, working groups, etc., which are the pillars that hold up the OECD. What people don't know about the OECD, I'm the head of a secretariat of about 2,500 people. We're not too many. We only have a few offices, small offices around the world, in Mexico, in um, uh, here in Washington. Jill runs our Washington office. Uh, Berlin and Tokyo. That's all. We're not a very large organization. But what holds us up are a hundred pillars, which are called our committees, which are the, all from biotechnology and nanotechnology to taxes and to health and to uh, budgetary issues and to macro issues uh, all over the place. Uh, all that have to do with economy, with um, uh, social issues and with uh, environmental issues. And they are formed by the people who are better informed and who are doing the policy in each one of the countries. And they are the ones who obviously have to agree on whether they can put together something for international cooperation. This is what also, this is below the surface, below the radar. This is happening all the time. This is what keeps us young. This is what keeps us relevant because they have the problems every day. They don't sleep about these issues and they come to the meetings and they tell us, help me with this particular issue. And that is what we are working on for three months, or months, four months, five months, six months. We deliver a report. Everybody discusses this thing. We turn that into policy recommendations for our members, increasing number of non-members. This is what this is how the knowledge is generated uh, uh, at the OECD. It comes from, if you will, the bottom up, and also from top down. And sometimes they meet at the middle. Now, would we we do have a lot? of independence, the relative independence that multilateral organizations have. That means we owe it, we ourselves to our members, but not to one member, but to the membership. In fact, our charter protects us from receiving instructions from any one member, which is very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, but it's not about you know protecting ourselves. If we had more, China then would be one more member, had to abide by the rules. They would not be able to tell us what to do themselves. But the collective. If India would join, they would have to, you know, abide by that. So, it is not a question of we. We always have to, you know, roll with the punches and understand the relative importance of each country and the relative importance of each country in a particular issue. Some countries are more important than others in particular issues, and then some countries are systemically important no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I think to kind of go back to the China question, but not to. The way that uh, perhaps in a, some naivete I would hope it works is that it is mostly with as it is with the European Union that countries want to get in, and in order to get in they need to meet certain standards yep. more than please join mm -hmm. because that will potential that could potentially undermine one no. of your great assets. No. Let me let me ask. We you would not dilute the standards in order to get right. a member your in. Mem uh -huh. That would not happen. Let me ask a different question um, and then go to the audience. You were extraordinarily optimistic, in my view, about the next round of heads of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, you referred to the fact that the G20 has made it clear that the new standard is that there shouldn't be any requirement on nationality. True. If you. I ask myself, is your optimism warranted? Do you want to comment a, a bit more? Because in a sense, the issue was on the table before the last round as well. 
This has been going on for more than three, four, five, six years. No, it's been not even even longer. You and I were writing about this a little longer than exactly, that. Exactly, you know? exactly. So what do you see a change that's larger than what has been pronounced in formal settings, yes, in formal yes. communiques? Maybe you could just say a word I, about that. Let, let, me, let, me, let me quote Nick Stern because it's, uh, uh, it, it, he stood up in the, I think it was the, uh, either in Davos, in one of the panels, uh, or, or uh, more recently, maybe in China, but he said, and please, you know, uh, Take very seriously this question that uh, that um, the next head of the IMF does not have to be a European, and the next head of the World Bank does not have to be you know an American. And well, of course, without prejudging whether the change is this time around or the next time, because there's already one European, one American, who are very competent in both institutions. So whether they roll up next time around or not, but it's for when their term limits come, whatever you know. But he said, whenever there's a change, and please. That would not be well accepted. I think we've crossed that bridge, frankly. I think now there is a very serious expectation and you know, we, we, we always look at governance issues. And the other thing is that if that happens in one of the institutions, it's gonna happen in the other because of balance between the big guys. And uh, I can only say, having been a governor at the World Bank, governor at the uh, IMF, and having looked at the guts of these, the governance of these institutions uh, together with you, and then having written about uh, uh, the, the president of the World Bank who lasted a very small period of time, so we sort of <laughs> refreshed refreshed the, uh, the, the the same document, gave it to Bob Selleck when he came in again, said, well, we had done this to your, you know, to uh, Mr. Wolfowitz, but this is, uh, you know, for you, uh, it's, it's just as good, it's, it's still relevant. And having written about the IDB, you know, and, and having chaired the task force on, on governance and the future of the IDB, et cetera. I would say that today, given the politics, given everything that has happened and given the G20, and given how much the G20 has staked its, its credibility on this particular deliverable, because the G20 does not have so many deliverables. Taxes is one of them, for example, this question, look at it. But these decisions on the governance of the IMF, the World Bank, etc., I think it's going to happen. So it's not a question of optimism. Basically, I think it's evidence-based, just like everything we do at the IG. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, let's turn to all of you for <coughs> questions. Great. Alex, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Alex and We're looking good. <laughs> Do I need a microphone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, We're probably thank taping. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that terrific talk and about, uh, is this on? Yes. Um, and uh, the congratulations on your 50th anniversary. I must admit, though, I was quite surprised that one particularly important aspect of your work you didn't really touch upon, and in the confines of the Center for Global Development, uh, that's talking about the whole role of the OECD and the Development Assistance Committee and the extraordinary influence over the years that I think that the DAC and the OECD together have had. Now, in particular, as you try to bring about some influence over the G20, and I know you've talked about your various, the, the links that you have with the G20 and the efforts that you're making to try to influence their policy directions in a serious way, there's been some talk around these, this street recently about what could be done if not in, uh, in at the uh, G20 meeting this fall, but next year in Mexico, but doing more to rationalize the international development system. And the OECD and the DAC have been at the forefront of trying to improve things. For example, the proliferation of global institutions at a time that it's making it much more difficult with resources scarce and the importance of oh. promoting. So uh, there are many specific things that the OECD and its secretariat, its very useful and important secretariat, could do to strengthen the hand of those who would like to see the G20 play that role of oh. helping to rationalize and getting into a little bit more of the development side. I mean, they've been working in these other areas you've stressed, 
but i don't know of any institution other than the o e c d that has the attributes that you and that's you've talked about that it would not be better could be better place to try to take the lead on these these issues of rationalization of the system that's my question thank you very much i i did mention work on development but but this point is uh, alex is, is very critical let, let me tell you why first of all the oecd does that uh, as a matter of fact every day because we are the home of the dac the development assistance committee is based at the oecd and by the way good news brian adwood is the new head of the dac he is both an old hand and a new hand because old hand in the sense that he's you know he is the head of the aid with, with president clinton and uh, then went to academia and now they extricated him back and and how he's the head of the dac and new in the sense that uh, he's now at the center of a multilateral organization which gets donors together and aligns their interest and hopefully will be able to uh, organize better the question of, of, of aid. Uh, we're going to have a new Tidewater, meaning, you know, those of, uh, those of you who have been to Tidewater meetings, which are the meetings of all the uh, uh, aid organizations around the world, including the World Bank and the IMF and the, uh, you know, OECD and some of the regional development banks, etc. We're going to have a Tidewater meeting this year in, uh, in London at the uh, end of July. Um, because Brian went to see Mr. Matthews, who is the minister of DFID, and uh, convinced him. And, you know, it's a new kind of a... It's good news to have Brian there. It's, it means it's good news to have the Americans back in the development business. Because they got, you know, big guns in terms of a lot of money, but also because they can mobilize things. And also because the U.S. are on a mission on terms of development. They're, they're, they have a new paradigm. You know, they're looking at... And we at the OECD, together with the Koreans in the G20, Gabriela was a very important player in this, uh, with Chong Jong Ri, who was the chief Sherpa of the Koreans, they got, uh, uh, after a, a, a big discussion that I had with Il Sagong, uh, with uh, the, 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 the minister, uh, president of the G20 organization, we, we produced a, a completely new approach to development at the G20 based on nine pillars, of which aid is one. Uh, aid, aid predictability, the aid flows, uh, the, but and aid effectiveness, which are the things that we're known for, that, that's one area. But the human resources, infrastructure, education, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, etc. All the things that we do at the OECD, as a matter of fact, for day-to-day -day mainstream for our members, are now going to be fully incorporated into the development role. So no more just aid, no more just a question of uh, the marginal. Uh, and, and I think this is a very important, the French are picking this up with gusto, but I agree with you. Because of agenda, because of time, it's probably gonna be the Mexicans who you know, are gonna be taking this with, with uh, maybe more more uh, center in their in their agenda because the agenda with the French now has been set. It's mostly about uh, the monetary system. It's about the commodities and price volatility, etc. And it's about the governance issues. Uh, but development is, is has to be a very important. Now, it's interesting. The G8 and the G20 are still struggling with development to see who's gonna because the donors, big guns, the big donors are in the G8. And they want to talk about it. And then in the G20, you're talking about policy. I think eventually that has to move to the G20. It's a better place there. As I told you, most of the G20 emerging or developing countries are net donors in any case. So you don't have a conflict. And second, it wouldn't be bad to be telling them, the donors, exactly what it is that the recipients would require, etc. So it is a very important, and I'm very happy to, 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 that, that we're reminded uh, about this particular role. There's a big change in this area, a very important change in the area. And of course, the World Bank is, is, is there all the time. Uh, the regional development banks are participating in the process. But what I mean is that there's a new context, a new concept, a new framework, a new approach to development uh, and even in the different agendas, for example, in the trade agendas, aid for trade. So now, we can't do Doha. Hell, you know, terrible. But 
A for trade. We're doing it for trade. A for trade is happening. So this is so I big think change. We only have a few minutes, so I think what I'd like to do, if, if it's okay with you, is co collect any more issues uh, and let everybody talk, and then you talk. Okay. And I'm going to actually add a couple of things to your agenda, so you'll choose. Because Good. you mentioned, um, I was glad that this, Alex's question led you to talk also about other elements of development strategy yep. that the G20 is grappling with, and with Gabriella here especially. Let me say, we've been pounding the table about duty-free, quota-free, all products for least developed countries. I hope that'll stay on the agenda. Our sense is that it's the U.S. that has been the most problematic amongst mm -hmm. the G20 mm -hmm. members. I want to remind you about migration, where you made a contribution working with us earlier on, and we have some important work where I think the OECD could revisit issues of international migration. And um, uh, well, let me leave it at that and then collect any quick questions and issues. Please go ahead, um, uh, Jeff. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Jeff Schott with the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, I was very pleased to hear your discussion of global economic governance, but there's one area which the OECD and its sister organization, the IEA, is at the center, where that governance is uh, less than efficient. Uh, and that is dealing with global energy issues. Uh, and particularly in light of the tragedy in, in Japan and Fukushima, uh, the uh, increased demand in China, uh, is there a way to rationalize the operation of the IEA and OECD so that China could become a much more active and, and perhaps full member of the IEA before it emerges as a member of the OECD? It seems that is key to global energy governance and dealing with uh, planning uh, uh, future supply demand issues. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, please. Mr. Ambassador. Please try to make your questions very, very quick. This is an excellent presentation and much, very well educated. And I'm, and I'm very particularly happy to see that the Harmful Tax Initiative has now matured now to become a level playing field. That's excellent news to me. And could we, we, we fought over that a couple of years ago, I think. That's now yeah. ended. Uh, the, the, the other question is to what extent now? Has the OECD's policies departed from the from the basis of the of free market fundamentalism? To what degree are you reforming or reconstructing a paradigm that has failed so catastrophically? Are you getting beyond the Washington Consensus? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, others, yes. And then Lawrence. And then we have to be quick, quick, quick questions. Hello, I'm Sandrine Rastello from Bloomberg. Um, just a quick question back to the news. In the light of uh, the resignation of the Portuguese Prime Minister, where do you see Portugal going? Do you, see, do you think a bailout by the IMF and the FSF is unavoidable? And uh, on the general uh, European agreement, do you think it goes far enough for the future to, to stop the debt crisis in Europe? <laughs> no, we didn't cut you off. By Trichet himself, so I just wanted you. Yeah, you weren't going to avoid the Portugal question and the Euro question. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence McDonald, Center for Global Development. Could you please tell us more about the OECD's special role on climate, especially in view of the U.S. failure to take any policy action in the resulting stalemate in the U.N. process? Okay, I think we better cut it off there. So I'm, with apologies to those in the back, maybe you'll stay for a few. We have a few minutes afterwards. Uh, on migration, I have to say, we've been working on migration for 32 years now. We produce the International Migration Outlook every year, and we add to the Migration Outlook every year now with a profile of the migrants, and then we add special issues every year, like brain drain, for example, on the health sector, 
uh, you know, uh, political migration, labor migration, etc. And uh, uh, with with Nancy, we we had been working on uh, something about Latin America in particular, and working on on these issues. But we we do work uh, extensively on migration. Migration being a very important element of the solution of may of the aging process in many of the European uh, very um, uh, mature uh, European economies and, and many of the Asian economies which are aging even faster than your European economies. And no. surely it will be on the G20 agenda in Mexico. At some point in time migration this is you know my, my, in the United States there are 300 million uh, of which uh, uh, almost 12 percent are uh, Latinos that's about 36 million of which 70 percent are Mexican that's 25 million either first generation second generation so you know Second, uh, energy, uh, Jeff, energy, Japan, the IA. The IA has, not ch has just changed its leadership. Mr. Tanaka uh, is going to uh, step down, and there is a new, uh, Maria van der Hoeven, a former Minister of Economy and Minister of Energy of the Netherlands, is going to be the new head of the IA. We are coordinating uh, better among the IA. The NEA, the Nuclear Energy Agency. In the OECD, we have a Nuclear Energy Agency. Very important, not very well known. And it's only for kilowatts. It's not for weapons of mass destruction. It's just, just, for, uh, just for kilowatts and isotopes, only for peaceful uh, purposes uh, and for safety and help members with the safety. The Japan situation, if anything, I just made a comment. And say, I hope it doesn't produce a backlash against nuclear and I hope that if countries continue with their programs on nuclear going forward, after having looked at every single aspect of the safety, after having taken all the lessons from the accidents that we saw uh, uh, on every, whenever we know more about this, because obviously uh, you don't have very, you don't have too many cases where you have a, a, a perfect disaster, you know, it looked like a bad movie with the greatest earthquake in history and then the, the biggest tsunami and then a, a, a a nuclear plant out of control, it's just, uh, where, by the way, all the shutdown mechanisms worked, uh, different from Chernobyl, uh, uh, and, and, uh, but, uh, but where we have a problem with a very basic technology about diesel plants not being able to cool the system inside. So, uh, but uh, the more important thing is, I think we need to do better in terms of the governance, we need to do better, but China is going to be delighted to, to be joining because the IA is about sharing the available supply. A country like Russia, maybe not so much because it's about sharing the available supply. So why is Mexico not a member? Because it's about sharing the available supply. And constitutionally they say, okay. But Norway got a waiver. Okay, I think Mexico could get a waiver and then they could join it. Yeah, I think we need to find ways. Now, the problem is all the members have to go through the OECD first and then to become members of the IA. I don't know that that particular uh, uh, rhythm of things should be broken, but the IA, like we do with the China, we can cooperate very closely with China. The problem is there is going to be greater demand on coal and on gas and even on oil because of the the furl of many of the nuclear uh, plants. As I said, I hope it's not because I, I believe this is, you know, nuclear is is not the solution, but it's certainly part of the solution. We, as I say, we have the nuclear energy agency inside our house and we, we, we're we convinced about that. We know it can be well. Uh, Ambassador, um, the uh, do have we departed from free market fundamentalism? Uh, if we were ever there, yes, we have departed. <laughs> Uh, uh, fundamentalism is not good for any kind of... But what I told you about the context today is bad. Low, lower output potential, high unemployment, low growth, high deficits, fast accumulating debt, bad scenario. And it's bad, it, you know, it, it would suggest fundamentalism, and whatever, that's wrong, we should depart from it, but it's also bad because it suggests that maybe we should depart so much that we should forget the fundamentals. We should not forget the fundamentals. Fundamentals are like saying, if you have 11% deficit, for heaven's sake, get it down, you know. It's just a question of common sense, you know. 
I was I was in in the UK last week with with uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron and George Osborne to launch the UK uh, uh, survey. You know, and uh, he said, "Well, this looks like a back slapping uh, club because you know the the." the Osborne says he agrees with all your recommendations and you are supporting their, their, their adjustment package. And I say, well, of course. Well, because they started 11% deficit. It looked like it was the inflationary numbers. It was the deficit, you know. And the problem, the problem in the UK is that like many other countries, not too many, they have a responsibility to the UK and to make it work in the UK, but they also have a, a part of their shoulders have to sustain the system. And if they... You know, if they don't do their stuff right, it's not going to be like in smaller countries that have have to carry their own load. They carry the system also, and if those systemic countries have a problem, the system is going to have a problem. So now I don't want to avoid talking about Portugal because yesterday, before we knew that uh, Socrates was going to resign, I warned whoever had to take any decisions, and uh, I've been in Portugal many times lately, and. Uh, that they're playing with fire, that, that it was a question of, uh, of, of a responsibility. It's not just a question of one more time when you're testing the political water and testing whether the government will survive and not a vote of confidence or whatever. The way, you know, this Portugal is, is, is being treated by markets obviously made this particular case a very, very delicate and extremely vulnerable case. And, and it was a case that should have been looked at in that particular light. Well. It wasn't, um, and uh, and now we're going to have to face the music. There's there's uncertainty. There's going to be a snap election going to be called maybe by by, by May, uh, and then we're going to see whether this government or not. But in the meantime, it's going to be a very rocky few weeks. And there's there are other countries out there after Portugal that were being frequently mentioned. Now Portugal. What, what is that they've been doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing on the deficit, on the structural transformation side, on their banking system, whatever. Uh, maybe the timing was a problem. Maybe it took too long. Maybe in the beginning they thought it wasn't going to hit them. What happened? But, uh, but it, is, it is tremendous. I mean, the rating agencies are downgrading Ireland in the middle of uh, the disaster, you know, or they're downgrading Greece, you know, on a Thursday when when they know it on the Friday the IMF mission is going to come in and is I I have to say the rating agencies have played uh, a, an extremely procyclical role. I, I'm using the most elegant <laughs> adjective I can find, and uh, um, and uh, uh, about the safety nets that the Europeans are putting together, we're going to be better off for it. There's a big sign out of Europe saying men and women at work. And that's what's happening now. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. You can't accuse them of being too fast. But they're building institutions. And they're building two types of institutions. One, the unthinkable of a year ago or two years ago. They are building a consensus about fiscal discipline. And then below, they're building a huge safety net for those that, for whatever purposes, go through the cracks. You know. Is it big enough? Well, yeah. well, I would say a trillion is a nice round figure, you know, and because uh, you got 500 billion plus 250 for the IMF and maybe 250 from the ECB in terms of the liquidity to the banking system, which we know has proven to be so critical in avoiding the crisis to manifest itself from the side of the short-term funding of the banks. So I think, and, and of course, if they got the mechanism and it needs, I, the, the idea is not going to be using it if you, if you really work mm. well on your, mm. on your uh, it's big enough to give you peace of mind. And it's also the idea that you're never going to have to use it because you work more on avoiding the problem. Better regulatory, what, what the crisis about? Massive failure of regula regulations, massive failure of supervisions, massive failure of corporate governance, massive failure of risk management. Well, regulations are being addressed, capital issues are being addressed, supervisory uh, capacities are being addressed, the network of regulators in Europe is being established, and a 
risk management system is being established at the uh, ECB in Frankfurt, we're going to be better off. You know, there's going to be something that goes wrong sometime, but at least the more evident lessons from the crisis in the European context in a very difficult coordinating system, because here you pass Dodd-Frank and then you got to implement. But uh, over there it's 27 countries. And it has happening, it is happening, it's going to happen this weekend in the context of the Portuguese, the Portuguese issue is going to give it a little bit more, you know, drama, if you will, of flavor. And it is a tragedy that this happened because Portugal was doing what it had to do. But as it's, the markets are not always... Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fact that the Trichet is worried, uh, it's okay, Trichet is, is the head of the central bank. Central bankers He's always, always have, to, have to be always worried. They have to appear worried. It's a professional thing, and it's it's part of their job. And if they don't appear worried, then people will worry about that. So it's a, it's, a, it's and he does a good job at worrying. He's a good worrier. So it's a. Uh, he's he's been absolutely invaluable in terms of maintaining the stability of the financial system by having very very early on decided that they go all out right. and finance the banks. Because otherwise the banks would have gone under and they would have brought the system down with them again. So I'd say very important role. Uh, and on climate change, I like to say we've been working on environment for about 40 years. And the last 20 to 25, we were working on climate change in particular. We were one of the first when it was not the flavor of the day, when it was not sexy, when it was not, you know, people didn't understand uh, what it was about. And we've continued to do that, and we're now working mostly on uh, adaptation. We were uh, probably the first institution that thought big about adaptation when everybody was thinking about mitigation. When the thing actually got in the front burner, it was about mitigation. And, and we said, listen, there's a lot of damage that's already been done by lack of action. And we worked on adaptation. We worked on, you know, who's going to get flooded first, which is a pretty horrible scenario, but anyway. Um, and we're working on the financing of the measures, on the economic instruments, on the questions of the taxes, the question of the, the ETSs, the, the, the uh, trading systems for emissions. But we're also working on the counterfactual because we believe that the cost of inaction um, is very clearly uh, higher than uh, any known path of action today which will lead us to a 450 uh, particles per million scenario, which will allow us to maintain the, uh, uh, the temperature change uh, at two degrees or below. Um, and uh, uh, there's, there's different degrees of performance. Uh, uh, the Europeans are doing very well. They're grandfathering a bunch of uh, uh, concessions, but I think they're doing very well. They're the most aggressive, they're the most ambitious. Uh, the United States, of course, uh, got uh, the legislation now is, is uh, passed in the lower house, but it's uh, uh, stuck in, in the Senate, and I hope that at some point in time it can move ahead. Let me just uh, leave you with a last thought. All the commitments known to us today about cutting emissions by 2020 and by 2050 even, are about 50% short. And that's just with the developed countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that's a, that, it, it's a big, big, uh, you know, it's a big uh, challenge. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the Mexicans because Cancun gave us back the confidence on multilateralism and it also rescued the very important but non but neglected progress of Copenhagen because Copenhagen detonated a number of commitments but those commitments today are clearly insufficient they are better than no commitments but they will not address fully the issue on the other hand I believe it's better to get started and in the process create a comfort zone particularly with the larger emerging economies, and particularly with China, so that their systemic responsibility is also discharged, but in a context which will allow for their development, not only economic, but also the social development, uh, to, uh, to detonate. And uh, it continues to be, continues to be, 
one of our greatest challenges. That, that's why I say, you know, we can't do Doha. How are we going to put 100 billion together every year uh, in order to get uh, the climate change uh, equation uh, going? Secretary General Gorilla, thank you. Gracias. Thank Please you. Join me in thanking you.